welcome to a special 15-year anniversary episode of Stories from the NNI. I'm Lisa Friedersdorf, Director of the National Nanotechnology Coordination Office. Today, it's my pleasure to welcome Jeffrey Neaton, Director of the Molecular Foundry, a Department of Energy-funded nanoscience research facility at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. To get things started, Jeff, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got involved in nanotechnology? Yes, I'm a theoretical condensed matter physicist, actually, by training. And I'm also kind of jointly appointed right now of a professor of physics at UC Berkeley. And uh, when I arrived at the Molecular Foundry in Berkeley, it was about 15 years ago. And it was coincident with the inception or the beginning of the Molecular Foundry. So I was kind of one of the original postdocs hired to jumpstart the Molecular Foundry. So I kind of got into nanoscience at the same time that the Molecular Foundry got into nanoscience. <laughs> I think that sort of scientifically, I spend a lot of time during my PhD and postdoc years using computation and, and the laws of physics, particularly quantum mechanics, trying to explore how materials might be pushed out of their comfort zones uh, using pressure and strain and discovering new behavior in those kind of regimes. So it wasn't really much of a stretch to kind of start pursuing nanoscience, where I think a central principle is that as a function of size, properties change, materials properties change. So yeah, I think that's kind of how I got in. I kind of got in on the ground floor. Well, I love your explanation or your description of pushing materials out of their comfort zone and thinking about the pressure or strain or the ability to maybe induce a phase change um, in a material, for instance, and the fact that as we do get into smaller materials, you reach a size where the crystal structure changes a little bit and, and things change, which give us these novel properties that makes nanoscience so exciting. I come at this as a material scientist, as may be obvious. So from the work that you're doing, where, where do you see the applications of enabling these new material properties when they get out of their comfort zone? What would you use those for? It's a good question. There are lots of applications, actually. One of the nice things about nanoscience that I kind of transitioning from my work prior to joining the molecular foundry is that, you know, if you think about a uh, pressure, for example, you can achieve uh, quite large pressures in the lab, something equivalent to what's going on at the core of the earth. And properties of materials change dramatically under pressure. So the oxygen, the air that we breathe, can become a superconductor, not just a metal, but a superconductor under extreme pressures. But the problem is when you cease to apply pressure, it goes back to just being normal oxygen. <laughs> so one thing that's kind of nice about the nanoscale is that kind of alluded to, it enables one to reach regimes where you can stabilize little chunks of material and kind of stabilize the novel properties that they're exhibiting because they're just a little chunk and not a bulk object. And so, yeah, that, that kind of allows you to, to change materials in a way that can be used in applications and Maybe a couple of things I'm kind of thinking about is that in nanoscience, we, we like to talk about quantum confinement. And I'm actually, you know, my, I'm an electronic structure theorist, so I like to deal with electrons <laughs> and understand how they behave in materials and how they give rise to materials properties. And quantum confinement basically comes about because electrons behave like waves and run across materials. And if I carve out a nanosized chunk of a material, bulk material, the electrons just are kind of trapped in that uh, nanosized chunk, and that kind of changes their properties. And so you can imagine getting different, you can actually not just imagine, but you can realize different optical and transport properties in uh, carved out nanostructures like quantum dots. In quantum dots, our example of an application, there are currently developing display technologies with quantum dots. And in part, because these quantum confined electrons can emit in a very narrow band of wavelengths, which is extremely desirable for such display applications. So that's just an, you know, maybe one example of how confinement kind of and the behavior of electrons can translate into applications. That's one of the great examples of nanotechnology commercialization success, you know, going from a, a research project in the 80s to these now mass market applications, which, you know, it takes time to do the R&D and get it into those applications. But I wanted to, to talk with you a little bit about the molecular foundry. When the NNI was stood up, one of the key needs that was identified is the access to equipment and tools, in some cases, that are too expensive 
in many cases, too expensive for an individual group or, or institution or small business to buy on their own. I understand, and you've talked a little bit that you are approaching this field from the computational side. Can you share what types of computational tools are available for folks to access and how you go about doing that? Yeah, so the Molecular Foundry is really quite a broad organization, and computation is a key piece, but it's actually also a small part of what is offered by the Foundry. But in terms of computational tools, basically we can offer things that really run, that enable people to to model and and do some predictive modeling and, and simulation of real materials in different environments of different size, different time and length scales. And that's something we kind of set out to do when we set up the Foundry theory group. And so there's a component of it has is certainly related to my own research, predicting the properties of materials, starting with their electronic structure, you know, having methods that predict the photophysical properties and then allow you to kind of change composition of material, change structure, and then look at how these photophysical properties change and be able to predict that in a way that can be you know, validated with experiment or could be relevant to experiment. And then on the other hand, there's a lot of activity, you know, materials are fluctuating at room temperature and, you know, atoms are moving and the dynamics of nanostructures are very important for applications actually. So materials degrade over time <laughs> and sometimes under operating conditions like a battery, phase transformations are involved as the battery charges and discharges. So we're trying to understand those kinds of phenomena at the nanoscale require dynamical methods. And so we also offer people the opportunity to, to simulate a materials and molecular dynamics of materials. So you kind of have the suite of electronic structure and molecular dynamics and, you know, using the laws of quantum mechanics and statistical mechanics. And, you know, the last thing I'd say was that the molecular foundry has got, as I mentioned, a lot of different experimental imaging and spectroscopy tools. So we can interrogate materials with all sorts of different probes. And what we would like to be able to do is do calculations that can compute what is being measured. (laughs) So we can provide a lot, a host of different information, a deeper kind of information associated with measurements. And so we actually offer that in the Molecular Foundry too. We allow users to compute things that they can compare with experiment and then deepen the understanding of their experiments and uh, allow them to move into the control and design as well as understanding of materials. So one of the highlights that came out of Lawrence Berkeley Lab, and I guess now this was a couple of years ago, but it really struck me as a as a major scientific accomplishment was the 3D atomic composition of an iron platinum nanoparticle. And the image was like a cutaway of this particle and identification of each atom in this particle where it was in this particular simulation. Do you remember that that work? Oh yeah, that you're right. That's a really remarkable example of advances in electron imaging. That we actually use as our cover to our brochure because I think that as a a scientific achievement of being able to compute and also have the capabilities to do imaging or, or some sort of interrogation and do that comparison is is really quite impressive. Yeah, I mean, and you know, what's interesting about that is what enabled that was really a dedicated effort over more than a decade of uh, development of instrumentation for advanced electron microscopy. And that's something that we are very fortunate to have a giant strength in that space. And a couple of things enabled it. One, of course, was high resolution electron microscopes with all the lenses and the collimators and achieving that sub angstrom resolution. The other was algorithms that allow one to do telegraphic reconstruction. But a third was sort of the advances in detectors. So, you know, once the electron microscope, electrons are incident on a sample, the electrons scatter and are collected by a detector. Berkeley Lab was the kind of first to develop a solid state electron detector before the electron detectors on microscopes were scintillators. And much slower and required higher doses. And so that actually direct electron detector enabled in a slightly different field, but related to the nanoparticle, this whole area of single protein imaging. And that culminated the Nobel Prize in chemistry uh, a few years ago. It's that area of (laughs) cryo-EM, as it's called. And so 
somehow the nanoparticle example that you just mentioned, I think it's like the inorganic material analog <laughs> of imaging the structure of these proteins. It's something, you know, looking at being able to get every atom in terms of its chemical identity and position in one of these nanostructures is a huge achievement. And it's basically the same technology that is necessary to, to do the single protein imaging that, that has basically revolutionized structural uh, biology. You mentioned that nanotechnology and the instrumentation that's been developed has really revolutionized or enabled the field of structural biology. And I think that we're, we're seeing that now with quantum science as well, is the, the tools and the, and the ability to manipulate matter and understand materials at the size scale are, are really foundational in the future work that's going to be done in quantum science. But I want to go back to the computational resources for just a moment. I wanted to ask if you have any collaborations or, or what your relationship is with NanoHub, which is the NSF network for computation and models and simulation. Yeah, so at NanoHub is this great NSF-funded resource, online resource with computational tools that allow anyone, you know, kind of anywhere in the world to, to access tools they may not have in their own backyard to do simulation. And uh, we, we actually worked, uh, we partnered with NanoHub for a few years, several years ago, to put some of the nascent software that we offer users up onto uh, and make it available through that, the Nano Hub. And so I think that that was a, actually we had a really great relationship with that center based at Purdue and the PIs there and kind of were able to generate some graphical user interfaces that allowed some of our software to be more easily used by a broader range of people. Can you share your thoughts on specific areas or world challenges where you think nanotechnology is going to play a role in solving, building on this foundation that we've built over the past couple of decades? I mean, there are many. I would say in no particular order, (laughs) uh, just a few. One is just replacing the transistor. Right now, we are working with technology, transistor technology that was developed in the 60s and 70s. We've miniaturized it actually due to advances in nanotechnology, (laughs) but it's gotten to its limit. So in terms of what will a transistor look like in 20 years, I think nanoscience is going to provide the forefront tools to address that problem. One of the possible replacements, probably not in 20 years, but but beyond, would be quantum computing. Right now, we have quantum computers that are strung together with uh, a few dozen qubits, But the qubit, I think, is far from optimized. And it's not even clear at this point what long-term might be the the preferred qubit in a quantum computer in the future. And I think understanding, you know, how energy is dissipated in qubits and how they might retain their state really through a nanoscale understanding of the material and their properties at low temperatures, nanoscience is going to play a huge role in that. Another area beyond information technology is energy. I think one particular area, energy storage, batteries, for example, understanding how batteries operate at the nanoscale and developing materials, for example, electrolytes that are not liquid and aren't flammable and <laughs> are safer and you know, are able to store, have a greater capacity for energy and are charged faster. Those kind of advances in technology and batteries are going to be helped by nanoscience. Better harvesting energy from the sun by maybe converting sunlight directly to chemical fuel, much like a leaf, so like an artificial leaf. You know, understanding how to do that is going to involve nanoscience. And then I think finally, there's all sorts of potential um, and intrigue at the interface between materials and biology. And even imagine now genetically encoding biological structures to kind of try to make materials. (laughs) Uh, One can imagine kind of artificial or or kind of electronic skins and things that can better integrate technology with our human experience. So I just want to thank you again for for taking the time to talk with me today. This has been a lot of fun. And I want to give you the opportunity to share any closing thoughts that you might have for our listeners. I think nanoscience is a truly multidisciplinary frontier. You know, it's about a link scale primarily. And if one gets beyond that link scale in terms of reduction in size, you're getting to the structure of the atom. (laughs) So in terms of understanding a lot of physics, material science, chemistry, engineering, biology, this is a real fundamental limit that, you know, nanoscience represents. So in that way, I would argue nanoscience is just, it's a nascent field. It's just begun. 
you know, we, it's, you know, started with the end and I, you know, 15 years ago, we've had many fabulous advances in that 15 years, but we're really just getting started. It's such an important link scale in terms of controlling and understanding for so many fields. And the other exciting part of it is that it's this multidisciplinary aspect of it. It's the fact that at that link scale, all fields converge. <laughs> One of the fabulous things about the Molecular Foundry and the NSRCs, these user facilities, which have just seen you know, incredible growth over the last decade in terms of engagement from the communities, is the ability for you know biologists, chemists, physicists to work side by side on you know really interesting problems, learn from one another, uh, advance and accelerate their areas. So definitely wanted to just chime in there. I think it's a very exciting field. Frankly, we're just getting started and yeah, I think a lot, lots of interesting areas of impact on the horizon. Thank you for joining us today for this special 15 year anniversary edition of Stories from the NNI. If you would like to learn more about nanotechnology, please visit nano.gov or email us at info at nnco.nano.gov.